This episode of UK Low Carb Podcast is sponsored by Deliciously Guilt Free. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to UK Low Carb. I'm your host, Dan Grief, and today and for the next few weeks, we're doing something pretty special. Graham Phillips and I have recorded some different episodes about topics we think you want to hear more about. Now, if you don't know who Graham Phillips is, he's best known for being the pharmacist who gave up drugs. And this is because he realized throughout the whole of his pharmacist career that the drug treatments he was giving were mostly plastering over the patient's ill health rather than curing them. He went back to the research and he discovered that lifestyle was often the root cause of most of the health issues. So every Tuesday, Graham and I will discuss topics such as calories, lipids, fat versus carbs, blue zones, aging, sleep, and a whole range of topics. Later in the series, we'll also hold a live event where you can ask any questions you have for Graham. So as you go along, take a note of anything that comes up and then you get your chance to ask him live. Now, Graham is also a member of the UK Low Carb Facebook group. So feel free to join in the conversation there after today's episode, where he'll be very happy, I'm sure, to engage in a bit of conversation and Q&A. I hope you enjoy these and any points, any thoughts you might have, go to UK Low Carb, where I'd love to carry on the conversation. I'm now going to hand over to the great man himself, Graham Phillips. Hi, Graham. Welcome back to UK Low Carb. It's been amazing to go through these episodes with you, um, and it's great to have you on today. Hi, Dan. Good to see you. How are you? Very well. I see our hair is getting slightly longer again, so maybe our next haircut's due soon. Um, <laughs> but it's nice to have the chance to go now, isn't it? Uh, which is which is very different. <laughs> I tell you two 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 tales. Right. The first one is the, my conclusion that the only relationship more sacrosanct than the one with your GP is the one with your hairdresser. Oh, for sure it is. Without that relationship, you're in a world of hair. Yeah, yeah. that's for sure. I mean, at least your lockdown hair is kind of it goes in the right direction. Mine just becomes like it becomes Afro. No, I'm the same. My hair just gets big. And so what I noticed in the end, I actually had a haircut. My mum saw me and said, you've lost pounds off your head, haven't you? I was like, yeah, I have. Because we get such thick hair in my family. Yeah. And it just gets bigger and bigger, almost like a crash helmet. So, uh, yeah, it gets a bit crazy, our hair. But anyway, thank you for coming back on the show. And... I must just, just share this with you. So well, the feedback's been fantastic so far. And a lot of people I know are listening have been engaging with every episode. There's more questions coming in all the time for our live at the end of all this, which we'll talk about uh, probably next week. Sure. Um, but today I thought we're going to talk about the topic you suggested of blue zones. And I thought this is really interesting because it's probably out of all the topics you said, the one I didn't know anything about because I don't know what blue zones are. And I'd like you to describe that all to us. Um, but before I do, I've got a quick question. What is um, average life expectancy of a human being? Average life expectancy? Um, oh, that's... Do you mean in the UK? Do you mean worldwide? Do you mean the potential life expectancy? I need to get you to define the question a bit. I'm not going to define the question because I think there's so many angles there which I knew you'd be able to go with. So yeah. tell us tell yeah. us what it could be, so what it is... So it's very interesting um, and it also varies by country and it also hugely varies between male and female. So if I said to you, do you think men are genetic? We know that generally men die younger than women, right? Mm -hmm. Do you reckon that's an inevitable genetic thing? Well, just speaking off the top of my head, probably yes, because why do they die before women? Yeah, okay. So if I challenged your thinking a little bit and I said, well, the difference in average life expectancy between women, men and women in the UK is, I might be wrong, but I'm not far out, about 0.7 of a year, maybe one year. Wow. I didn't certainly know that. The it's certainly less than two. You'd assume it'd be like five or something. And I find, if I said to you, but that varies hugely across the UK. Yeah. So in, I think the highest life expectancies in the UK, is, I think it's Westminster. Okay. <laughs> I wonder why. Nice, nice part of the world. But also yeah. Devon and Cornwall have got right. very high life expectancy. And in fact, if you're a blue collar worker living in 
Glasgow yeah. compared with a white collar worker living in Devon. Yeah. There's a, di a life expectancy difference of, I think, 10, 12 years. Can I tell you something even more shocking? The city where I am right now, Cambridge, has got the same difference of 10 years between two of the wards in the same city. Yeah. Now that, that, I think, is shocking. You can actually see it. So if you go from Westminster and take the tube in any direction, with each stop, life expectancy goes down by about 10 years. Oh, my word. 10 years by each stop? Sorry, two years. I, I was think... going to say, what, you must I'm die sorry. at age of two otherwise. Sorry, like... it two years to stop, right? <laughs> right, but right. probably if you, were be if you were very selective about the stops, it might do. So I always say that if you're sort of a 60-something uh, blue-collar uh, male living in Edinburgh, get on a train down to Devon pronto because it'll add 12 years to your life. Yeah. <laughs> Each stop. <laughs> well, no, just the whole journey. So what if we had like the perfect lifestyle, the perfect health of a human being who would then die naturally? What could we live to? Well, well that's the subject of much debate. Um, and we've also got to sort of disinter... It's complicated because there's life expectancy and there's healthy life expectancy. Right. Um, now, we haven't done this up till now, but I kind of think maybe today we should have a slight departure. And I've got just three or four slides I'd like to share with you that kind of illustrates the journey quite graphically. What do you think? Sounds great. And what I'll do for anyone who's listening to this as the podcast only, it will go on YouTube as well. But I'll describe what Graham's talking about. And I know that Graham's very good at describing things uh, and making a visual picture for you. So um, what he'll have on the screen, I'll describe and he can just talk through. And at the moment, just uh, he just took up the first slide and it says, so you want to live to 100. And there's a chap on the left where it says health span. And then there's a chap on the right and above him, it says lifespan. And it says health span versus lifespan. The chap on the left looks incredibly fit and healthy with medals around his neck and his arms raised up in a strong man pose. And then there's a poor fellow on the right who looks quite vulnerable and very, very frail being fed by somebody um, with a spoon. Exactly that. So I think this illustrates the difference. So if you look how health systems are judged, health systems tend to be judged in terms of how long you live rather than how well, how well you live. Yeah. And the evidence, it, it, so the current um, NHS budget is about £140 billion. Pounds. Wow. Um, whereas the Public Health England budget is about £4 billion. So my argument is that we're spending 90% of the money locking the door after the horse has bolted and 1% of the budget tethering the horse. Right, right. If I said to you how much life health not health span but lifespan how much additional lifespan do you think we get from the the entire nhs system how many more years of life is it giving us do you reckon Oof, 10 maybe i don't know yeah i'd have thought 10 15 turns out it's i think 2.3 years wow and it's not necessarily good life either and it's 2.3 years of health span of lifespan but not health span right this is what i'm trying to illustrate so the guy on the left both these guys are 82, let's say, when this picture was taken. The guy on the left is a guy called Charles Yugster, and you can, he's all over YouTube, actually. And he was a British dentist. And the point about Charles was he was basically a couch potato until his 60s. And he describes reaching his 60s and wanting to, de to develop, as he describes it, a beach body. Right. And at that point, he became sort of a, a veteran Olympian. And he became a bodybuilder. And you can see that there. He's a very fit guy. I mean, I would assume looking at him, he's been like that his whole life. No. And he, there are all these photos of him uh, on the internet. He's, he's got a fantastic TED Talk. Maybe we can link to his TED Talk in the show notes. Yeah, definitely. And there are all these photos of him um, on the internet, uh, surrounded by scantily clad young ladies. And he, I think he lived in the end into his mid-90s. Can I just tell you at this point, I have been going to the gym since lockdown has ended. Uh, I'm not at his stage yet, but maybe one day, although best if you're in this, obviously not for that <laughs> reason. OK, <laughs> but the point about this, I mean, you know, um, I don't think um, sex in older people is talked about enough, but actually fit, healthy, older people go on having it, it's part and it's normal part and parcel of life. Of course. And, and I think it should be talked about more as well as being absolutely. something that you should you should have in your life if you so wish. Um, yeah. You know, 
when I was 30, I didn't think people of 60 have sex. Yeah. Now I've reached 60, you kind of think, well, do people of 90? And the answer is everyone continues to have sex if they're able um, and fit and able to do so. Being a healthy human being, completely. Sort of normal life, normal relationships. Yeah. And it's very much hidden in the older population because we kind of, I mean, I think old people are generally hidden from society and not discussed enough. Um, well, our next episode is on age, and I think that is definitely something you could talk yeah. about there because that is that is really true, isn't it? Um, and as a, as a community pharmacist, of course, I see lots of older people, and my, my take is there's a few of them who are really are miserable old salts and who think just because they're old means they can be as grumpy and rude as as they want to be because they're some way entitled to be. But the vast majority of them, you have the most incredible stories to tell and a rich life. Uh, l rich life lived and so much experience and wicked sense of humour and don't and take don't take themselves too seriously. Yeah, and I think all of this is kind of hidden in our perfect bodies, perfect society, Instagram, perfect food, all of that stuff. Yeah. And anyway, youth. So back at the story. So Charles became an Olympic medalist, um, won all these veteran medals, fit and healthy, um, and. Whereas the guy on the right, you can see he's in his wheelchair, he's slumped over his food, he's dribbling into his soup. But I guarantee you someone's still spooning statins into him. Yeah. And this illustrates to me perfectly the difference between health span and lifespan. And, you know, if, if the end of life looks like that's why I have this challenge, do you want to be want to live to be 100? And I think your first thought tends to be, yes, I do. And then my, your second thought is, well, if it looks like the guy on the right, you know, take me out and shoot me now. Whereas so, look, so you can live to 100 in both ways, but obviously want to live with a health span. It, the chap on the left, by the way, who, who is the healthier of the two, yeah. how, could, how long could somebody like that live for then, uh, healthily, do you think? What, what can we go through to 100? Is that, is that feasible? Well, so we've talked about health span at lifespan. And as I say, our, our focus is on health span. How long do you live? So the whole idea of the prolongevity programme isn't just for people to live longer, but to live longer in good health. Right. or to die very young at a very old age or however you want to whatever metaphor yeah you... yeah yeah so the science appears to show that the maximum life expectancy of a human being is 120. whoa okay and, and that's are... based on cell regeneration is it the absolute well, no. longest you can go or no well that's interesting so um we can get into that because actually that all of that's being challenged and pr the most interesting person to follow i think is professor david sinclair and that's a whole other podcast, really, uh, looking into life extension. But he is saying that potentially um, you could be living to 150 to 200 years in excellent health at some point in the future, not very far away. OK, so I just want to describe those people who are listening only. Graham's now put up on the screen uh, a table, a graph, and on the X axis, We've got age and on the y axis, we've got increasing to vitality at the top. Um, and then he's got different, I suppose, lifestyles. Different uh, life curves, life, life, life curves. Sorry. Okay. So do you want to just describe what you've got here then, Greg? So in the ideal scenario, you live to 120 and die in your sleep and your vitality would be unchanged. Yeah. And that's what the top curve illustrates. So basically, you can see maximum life potential 120 years, vitality almost unchanged until the last weeks of life. Yeah. That's how we all want to do, right? Be fit and healthy one day and then die in our sleep. Yeah. Aspir it's an aspiration for all of us, I think. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I talk to people who are, you know, a lot of my clients are sort of 40 to 60. And I say, well, do you want to live to 100? And they say, well, not if it looks like that. And I say, what about if I could offer you this? So, but most people end up with declining health and they're, 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 actually their health probably starts to decline. Well, it, 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 the, the, the truth is that it probably starts in, in utero because if you've really? got- Really? Yeah. So the environment of the uterus dictates quite a lot how the baby comes out. So you know that we're seeing more and more um, all of us are getting fattier and more diabetic. Yeah. And you're probably aware of uh, gestational diabetes. Um, well, in fact, you've well, done I've had it. 
Well, you, 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 right. My wife, my wife had gestational diabetes. <laughs> That's why I got into low carb in the first place, through gestational right. diabetes. And we didn't want to have a larger baby because yeah. of the health implications for that child. So that's why we cut our sugar and carbs rather than uh, best been taking the insulin route. Yeah. So healthy life begins at conception. Yeah. So healthy mother and a healthy father creates a healthy egg mm -hmm. and then a healthy environment in the uterus. Yeah. Has a huge epigenetic effect. So um, how genes are expressed, so it used to, the belief used to be that your genes were your destiny and it was all fixed. Um, and again, as I say, we'll have to do another podcast to really get deep into this. But actually there's this whole new area of epigenetics which are really exciting. Turns out your genetic expression is far more plastic than we thought. And, and there are lots of options. So how a baby experiences life in the uterus has a huge effect on future life. Wow. So I, mean, I know you've got a keen interest in politics and politicians, a lot of politicians from all parties talk about, you know, where you've come from and how it dictates your future. Yeah. yeah. Health, the, it, these inequalities are built in. Yeah. And they're not just built into life course, they're built into health, your health course as well. Wow. Amazing. Uh, and that is why it's so important to have a healthy, low insulin environment in the uterus. Yeah. Because that, that and they've shown for example you, it's obviously doing these studies on is difficult with human beings because of the length of life but they've shown that in rats if each rat is diabetic the baby rat comes out more diabetic and over three generations they get more and more un inherently unhealthy due to this kind of epigenetic change wow we're probably seeing that in human beings right so uh, coming back to my slide, so I'm 60. I thought I'm 62. I don't, how did that happen? Yeah, how did that happen? <laughs> you turned 60 and you look around and two more years have gone past. I know. Yeah. Um, well, a couple of reflections on that. One is that I'm physically much fitter than I was when I was 30. Yeah. And I weigh less. Yes. And I'm much, in many ways much happier. Yeah. yeah. I'm getting more out of life than I did when I was 30. Yeah. So I want more of this life stuff, you know. Um, when you're 30, 60 seems really old. Now I'm 60, 90 seems quite old. When I get to 60, 90, I'm hoping that 120 will seem old. Yes, so yeah. Most guys of my age have got at least one, if not two, long-term conditions. Yeah. Hypertension, dementia, can't, whatever, right? And we then go to our doctor and the doctor gives us tablets and that extends our life. Yeah. But it's extending our lifespan. It's not really extending. It's, ex it's extending our health span, not our lifespan. So we're living longer in poor health. Right. That's not really ideal, is it? So right. if we could all live to 120 and die in our sleep, I think that's an option we'd all choose. Yeah, as long and, as it's a good life until that point, for sure. Which brings me neatly to these areas of the world called the blue zones. Now, can I just pause there for a second? Because... Yeah. Whenever I see a map with parts of the world being studied for health, I automatically have a gut reaction of the seven country study and a bit of a, uh, what, is the, what is this study? So can we just go through what the blue zones are and yeah. how they were researched a little bit? Because this is actually a part of a country. It's not saying the whole country is based on this one area, is it? Exactly right. Um, interestingly, um, the reason they're called blue zones is because when they were discovered, the guy who discovered them got a blue pen and inked the area with a blue pen. Oh, I so see. It sounds like <laughs> a wonderful mystical thing, blue zones, but it's yeah, just yeah. A attribution. <laughs> These are areas of the world where men and women lead lives of equal length, which kind of brings me back to where oh, our conversation began. Interesting. They are areas of the world where people live to 100 plus in fantastic health and they do so at rates 10 20 50 times higher than most westernized industrialized societies right they are air they are tiny parts of entire countries so most people are aware of okinawa in japan where which is the longest lived blue zone so it's not right. the whole of japan it's a tiny part yep it's an island isn't it i think or so it it's is. off to the mainland oh, yeah japan. Uh, you've got Icaria in Greece, Sardinia in Italy, um, uh, uh, Nicoya in Costa Rica, and very, very interestingly, an area in America. So America does have a blue zone, despite everything you've heard. Yeah. It's in Loma Linda, California. Wow. Now, your first thought might be, okay, 
So we know, what do we know about these areas? We know that men and women lead lives of equal length and that people live into this incredibly healthy old age. Mm-hmm. And actually, we might want to link to this in the show notes. There's a fantastic TED talk by a guy called Dan Bootner, who's an explorer, who is one of the people who explored the, the blue zones. And it might be the best 12 minutes of your life you ever spend. It's literally 12 minutes and it's an absolute revelation and an inspiration. Wow. Certainly one of the things that inspired me on my journey. Okay. So your first thought might be, okay, so they've all got uh, uh, lucky genes. They've just got this fantastic genetic resilience and that's why they live longer. So they're just more resilient. Just like some people can get away with smoking and it doesn't seem to affect them. And some people can drink way more than others and they seem to be okay. They're just naturally resilient. Well, the thing that's interesting with that, of course, like Greece, Italy and Japan have been populated for hundreds of thousands of years, whereas the the communities that are now in Central and and North America are much more cosmopolitan and mixed, aren't they? So I guess genetically, that's a hard argument to make. And, And there's more to it. So why should it be that there's just this little bit of Greece, this little bit of Italy and a little, little bit of Japan where they've suddenly got these genes? You know, they're not, it's yeah. not like they're remote islands where there's been no genetic interplay. Yeah. But the other one that mo- in many ways is most compelling is Loma Linda because the Loma Linda co- uh, community are a multicultural community. Right. Now, if they're multicultural, there's not no genetic. gene pool. Yeah, yeah. And you might, if you look across these different areas, there's no common gene pool here. Yeah. We've only got lifestyle or genetics. So genetics are out the window, it must be lifestyle. Exactly. And the uh, community in Loma Linda, they're a religious community. And a lot of them, so they lead a very specific lifestyle and quite a lot of them are vegan. Right. You know, I'm not pro-vegan, not in the sense of, promoting it but there are certainly if you compare a vegan diet with the standard american diet the standard american diet is so terrible you know mcdonald's yeah. pizza huts and ultra processed food that vegan anything. That is in that versus battle yeah and a lot of them are not all of them but quite a lot of them don't drink alcohol okay. so what they've got in common is a lifestyle yeah and that's true across all of them so these areas have been extensively, this is my last slide, you'll be pleased to know. Um, these areas have been extensively studied by this team from the National Ge- Geographic, led by Dan Bootner. And they've tried to learn what they call the Blue Zones lessons. Okay. Um, and obviously this is several PhDs and I'm trying to distill it into 10 minutes. So, you know, so basically not- this, this is like the common factors in each one of them. What can we learn from these blue zones that we can extrapolate, distill, bottle and put into our own lives? Right. Okay. And at the end, what's the value? What would we get from it? So the first of these is natural movement. Yeah. Now, if you think from a genetic point of view, we're somewhere between a million and two million years old. Mm -hmm. We are literally cavemen living in a space age. Yeah. And it was only... 10,000 years ago that we became farmers and radically changed our diet. Yeah. Now, so I want to return to that, the dietary thing, but the natural movement, if you think about a hunter gatherer, I don't think they went to the gym very much. (laughs) They're not a gym guy like me, six times in four years. (laughs) Well, well, the point about going to the gym is it's better than being a complete couch potato. But what most of us do is that we're couch potatoes for 23 hours and we do an hour of low level cardio in the gym. Yeah. And admittedly, it's better than nothing, but it's not that it doesn't really give you that much benefit. It's not the same as walking to work or cycling to work and then being active at work instead of just sitting down all day. There's all those changes, aren't there, you can make. But also because when you walk to work, you're out in the sun, you're getting, you of know, course, so we try to abstract everything, don't we, right? So when you go to a gym, you exercise this little finger, then you separate that finger and this, yeah. right? that's not functional movement. No, no. And if you think about the, the example I always give, if you ever go on a plane journey, there's always a few older people on the plane. Yeah. Watch them lift their luggage into the locker. Mm. You, what you will see them do is they'll be able to pick the luggage up and they'll get to more or less this point which is kind of shoulder height yeah right and then they lose it right so they're like this yeah and you think 
bloody hell, uh, I need to help them get that piece of luggage into the locker. Because yeah. if I don't, either they're going to kill themselves or they're going to kill me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've lost all their upper body strength because we never move up, we never use this area above our arms, right? In, in our more normal life, your arms never go above your shoulder height, do they? Yeah, so they don't never get any work out. Above yeah. your head. So the back muscles, the chest muscles haven't been worked much. Yeah, of yeah. course. And also, they've got no balance. So they're, 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 they're all, I like this before they even start. Yeah, yeah. So the natural movement of a hunter-gatherer would have been moving naturally for a lot of the day, gathering, and every so often run like crazy, either to kill something or avoid being killed. Yeah, yeah. Now, I don't know about you, Dan, but it's not often that I wander up the high street with, in my loincloth bearing my spear. Not since the right. uh, court order, no. <laughs> no, exactly. That's what happened last time. <laughs> so it's not so worth it, is it? Kind of thinking, okay, so how relevant is this? What's the modern equivalent? Well, the one thing is that it, walking is one of the exercises that has been shown, one of the very few forms of exercise that's been shown to reduce your dementia risk. Wow. And is it because you're also, using your whole body when you're doing it? Because we're designed to walk. Yeah, That's yeah. What we're supposed to do, right? We're not designed to sit on our backside and call, Alexa, bring me everything. Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, but also, so natural movement, and that, so the example I would give is the movement of a politi of, of a, not a movement of a politician, where did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> That's a Freudian slip, isn't it? That really is. Isn't it? <laughs> I, should have said, I should have said a postman. A postman, yeah. Or a very, very different. They're likeable. Yeah, carry on. <laughs> yeah. The movement of a postman, and it's very interesting, actually. There's a fascinating study that they did in the 50s, and they compared two sets of blue-collar workers. Right. They compared the... Back in, in the days when there were conductors and drivers of buses. Yeah. And the driver is sitting down all the time, very stressed, trying to avoid having accidents, with the cortisol spiking all the time. Yeah. Permanent fight or fight mode. Whereas the conductor's got a much nicer, much more interactive, less stress. He's, you know, it's a much more of a humanistic. Trying to help people, he's chatting to them. Yeah, yeah. much more social. And I think there was a huge difference in life expectancy and cardiovascular risk. Incredible. Wow. Now, and that's just the lifestyle and what they're doing each day, not even their food. Natural, yeah. Right. So it's nudge theory, right? So natural movement. So something like a postman, something like a waitress, they're moving steadily all the time. Yeah. And every so often running like crazy, sort of like every so often you do the 200 metre hurdles. Yeah. And that is why high intensity exercise gives you so much more benefit than low level cardio in the gym. Yeah. Well, and I see if, them on the treadmills now. I go to the gym. I do weights. That's my thing. Yeah. And, uh, and I see people on the treadmill and I think you do that every day. Your body's going to adapt and think, oh, we're fine now. Whereas I, with my weight training, I change it all the time and I go really heavy really light but more and more reps and then i the next day do fewer reps and higher weights so i want my body to never know and get adapted to what it's doing i want exactly to challenge right. it the only and i'm very very much in favor of weight training it gives you a much better bang for your buck but also when you do the weight training dan do you get absolutely so breathless you couldn't hold a conversation um i well i, I don't know because i go by myself and i generally work my muscles until failure so yeah. I keep going until I just can't do it anymore. That's different. So the only thing I would do is in between all of that, I do some high intensity. Yes, I think you're right. I think that's important. Yeah. You want to take your heart rate up to its absolute maximum. Yeah. Yeah. As well. So natural movement, right? Or the equivalent of a natural movement. The next one is having a purpose in life. Mm -hmm. And they've shown, for example, um, I think I'm right. You're a religious guy. I, I used to be. Yeah. Not so much now. Um, Having a purpose in life, um, a, you know, um, a reason to get out of bed, uh, as the Japanese call it ikigai, a joie, you know, uh, joie de vivre. So having a purpose in your life has a huge effect on life expectancy. Yeah, I can imagine. And there's this famous story of, of the Apollo project. And most people working in large companies have got no sense of what their role is and how important it is to, within the company or what the, what the business is trying to achieve. Yeah. And they asked the guy who swept the floor at Apollo what his, what his job was. And he said, I'm helping to put a man on the moon. That's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. And if we could take people with us with that sense of purpose. And a mission in life and a yeah. that we're trying to aim for. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, I'm not religious, but I have a very, you know, I have a real sense of what, what, I, what my life's for.
Yes, yeah. And particularly with prolonged gravity, it's... You're, you're definitely on a mission, aren't you, Graham? It's a reason to live, a reason to get out of bed, you know, yeah. it's, yeah. it's fulfilling. The next is the ability to deal with stress. And they've also shown that in societies where they take an afternoon siesta, there are lower levels of dementia. Oh, wow. And most of us are... I mean, how... I mean, if... I, COVID has amplified the stress in everyone's lives beyond all imagination. I mean, you just, we've been lived in this kind of dystopian reality for the last 18 months. Yeah, yeah. But even before that, so there's all this evidence that people are addicted to their social media and that iPhones and so on are, are designed to be addictive. Oh, yeah. they're time, really made for that purpose, aren't they? To make your brain they're made sing to... with the endorphins and whatnot. Exactly. Yeah. So every time I get a like on one of my tweets, I get a dopamine spike. You must not get a lot of dopamine spikes then. Ooh! <laughs> <laughs> Moving swiftly on. <laughs> um, these dope... So there are basically... Dopamine is the addictive hormone that gives you the high. Right. And serotonin is the happy hormone. Right. You want lots of serotonin, but you do not want to be continually spiking your dopamine because those are the pathways that you get from cocaine. I see. So so the other one, serotonin, would be more like a, a, a relationship with somebody where you feel content and happy. And it's a slow release. It's not the spike of meeting somebody for the first time. Oh, my God, they're amazing, which is not a natural thing to have every single day of your life. Yeah. yeah. And that is where all these addictions come from. So you can be addicted to cocaine. You can be addicted to alcohol. You can be addicted to social media, which is my addiction. Yeah. Um, and also these highly addictive foods. So these uh, we've talked previously about these um, foods with, uh, the, and the, the bliss point. point. And yes, yes. Yeah. Um, they all spike the same neural pathway, the dopamine pathway. So your ability to manage stress and downshift very, very important. Right. The next is what they eat, how they eat, and when they eat. So it's that combination of they eat organic food because they don't have a choice. That's all that's available. Right, okay. I used to believe that organic food was just food for food fetishists. Yeah. I'm now absolutely convinced that one of the best investments I can make in my own health is to eat organically. Yeah, which basically means that that's that's a term I think which marketing has made seem like they've done something special to it. But it's actually the other way around, isn't it? They've left it not touched by us as much as possible with regards to chemicals, yeah. which is hugely different, isn't it? Really, you're basically saying, do you want it untouched or or covered in chemicals and yeah. stuff by humans? Now, there's an argument that even if you eat organic food, our food has been so modified as to be, you know, so different. So, you know, this whole thing about healthy whole grains. Yes. Yeah. Um, which everyone believes in. Actually, grain has been genetically modified to the extent now that the modern grain and it's, it's dwarf. Actually, I was on a podcast the other day and the guy said, oh, I said to him, you know, traditional einkorn, I think it was, had 16 genes and our modern wheat has got 32. Wow. And I said to the guy, um, this is on a um, sports podcast. If, if I if I doubled your genes, would you be the same being or would you be fundamentally different? Yeah. And he said, well, at least I'd be taller. And I said, <laughs> you might be shorter. Actually, um, you wouldn't be. It'd be somebody else. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> You'd be very different, yeah. So um, we're eating these healthy whole grains, thinking they're healthy, but they're not. They've been genetically modified. Yeah. And um, coming back to what I was saying before, in the generation in which we turn from being hunter-gatherers towards farmers... The next generation, they were a foot shorter. They had smaller brains and they had terrible dentition. Wow. So this kind of modern disease, which has escalated, actually probably started 10,000 years ago. Yeah, well, that is modern in terms of humanity, though, isn't it? Yeah. So 10,000 years seems like a long time to you and me, but actually we had this fundamental change with the introduction of all the grains into our diet 10,000 years ago, Yeah. which is a blink of an eyelid in evolutionary terms. Yeah, definitely. And look how that's all been modified since. And you can see that we're literally brings me back to the cavemen in the space age, space age. So organic food, um, they tend to eat uh, seasonally because they have no choice. Yeah. And they tend to eat mindfully and socially. Right. So it's a communal not, event, not just to chuck it down your neck as a fuel source. And they've been it's been shown that simply having to chew your food has a huge effect on all sorts of body systems 
<laughs> and the point about the modern finger foods, the McDonald's, is there's almost no chewing involved. It's almost pre-digested. Right. And so we've moved so far away from anything recognisable as food. Um, and then they tend to sort of eat till they're comfortably full. Yeah. Now, one of the things, I've got this terrible tendency, I've always bolted my food. Yeah. And if I go for a social gathering and there's, um, and you can get several plates, you know, like there's a buffet. Yeah. I'll go to the buffet I'll, and I want everything because I'm a pig. But it's so all in I'll, front of you. It's been, you're, don't forget, your brain is, is been evolved to try and get food when you need to get food. And there it is on front of you, one go. It's a bit too much for you, your brain, which is basically, like you said, a caveman brain to deal with, isn't it? And I, I've, I've got absolutely no self-control. So I'll, I'll, I'll get this mound of food, go back and I'll be talking to, you know, whoever I'm socialising with and I'll spoon it in literally like this. Yeah. I won't even experience have experienced the food. Yeah. And of course, in a buffet, the whole point is you eat as much as you want. So I'll go and have a second one. And everyone so, has to go for a second one as well. Right. So now I've probably eaten four adult portions. Yeah. And I'm still not full because I haven't. So I've now trained myself. And I, I get my partner to remind me to actually cut my food up, put a forkful in my mouth, put my knife and fork down and experience it. Yeah, what I eat that more makes. slowly and mindfully. A, I enjoy the food much more, but B, it allows your hormones to do what they're supposed to do, which takes yeah. about 20 minutes. So you can easily eat four adult portions in 20 minutes or just enjoy one adult portion. Yeah, yeah, and be a lot healthier for it. <laughs> now, the next is a plant slant. Now, as you know, I'm not pro-vegan or vegetarian. I accept those are choices that people can legitimately, legitimately make, but we're not designed to be vegan. We're designed to be eat meat. Yeah. But um, as you know, I follow Tim Spector and the whole uh, microbiome thing. Yeah. One of the Tim points that Tim makes is if you want a healthy, robust microbiota, colony of bugs in your gut, which you've discussed previously, what you want is a variety of plants. So he says eat 40 different plants a week. Really? That many? Wow. Yeah. Which sounds difficult until you think, well, if I go um, to my local Tesco's, which I do at lunchtime, and buy three or four salads and combine them, you know, and I put some um, a mixture of seeds on them. Yeah. And add something different each day. That's probably might be 20 or 30 different foods in one go. So once you really focus on it, it's not that difficult. Yeah. Got you. So this combination of um, eating organically, eating mindfully, and when you eat. So the other, the third aspect of it is um, what most of us do. We wake up and eat, and then we have a snack, and then we have a meal, and a snack and a meal. Yeah. So we're actually eating almost from the minute we wake up to the minute we go to sleep. Yeah. And, and we've been educated by the food industry that in between foods to keep the system going whatever marketing bull they come out with yeah you've got to be eating almost 24 7 topping up that sugar level throughout the day yeah right not true so one of the things that i do within pro longevity is i first of all get people to i don't talk about calories and i don't get them to worry about any of that i just get them to stop eating the addictive highly processed highly highly carb filled food yeah and then i and then I get them to stop snacking. So I'll get them, instead of, instead of eating three meals and three snacks, I'll say, look, consolidate the snack and the meal into one thing. Right. And do that three times a day. Makes and a lot of sense. They're no longer starving all the time. And they're, yeah. blood, they're not having the sugar roller coaster. They find that quite easily. Mm -hmm. So now we're eating three meals a day. The next thing I say is separate the first thing you eat and the last thing you eat by 12 hours. So that's your like, intermittent fasting window that you're just making part of your day almost. You're not even feeling it, are you? Uh, we have to be careful. That isn't time, that is time restricted feeding. It's not intermittent fasting. Okay. Fasting is something else. Right. But there are huge benefits of time restricted feeding. So yeah. even if you get people who eat a terrible diet to eat less frequently and consolidate their food, they get a benefit. Right. Okay. So by this stage, they're starting to, they're not hungry anymore. They haven't got the sugar roller coaster and then they start to skip meals. Yeah. And what we generally do over time is we get them to, to um, eat. So for me, for example, weekdays, I'm OMAD, one meal a day most days. Yeah. 
the fasting thing comes into this whole life extension thing, which I think is a separate podcast. <laughs> that probably kicks in at a minimum of 36 hours. And right. then there are benefits of, and you've known from your stuff with the wolf pack, it gives you yeah, those yeah. Kind of benefits. But a plant slant diet, so uh, which means a variety of a, a cute, the biggest variety you can find of different colors um, and different plants. Right. Together with plenty of healthy fats and protein. Okay. So now what you're doing is instead of consuming loads of calories, so our typical Western diet, if you think about the food pyramid, right, the tip of it is micronutrients and nutrition and the base of it is calories. Yeah. We're eating a ton of, of, of calories. But no nutrition in it. Almost no nutritional value, but a ton of calorific value. And actually, we're, the, pal the pyramid should be the other way up. You need to pick the pyramid up and turn it up on its tip, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now you're eating tons of nutrition, but not much calories. Because unless you're running a marathon any day, what do you need the calories for? Yeah. Your body always will look for those, the extra nutrition. So just in the theoretical case in which you've got twice the calorie density and half the nutritional density, in order to get the nutrition that you need, you've got to eat twice as many calories. Yeah, yeah. Turn it on its head and you'll be happy and not hungry. Yeah, exactly, which is what, exactly what low-carb does, doesn't it? It's the more nutritious food, which actually can have more calories, but you just don't need as much of it um, because you are so satiated, but also feeding yourself properly. Yeah. Can I ask you about the next one? Because yeah. on this list... Uh, of nine things which uh, have been identified from blue zones yeah. it says wine at 5 p.m now that's certainly yeah. got my interest so as you know um i'm not anti-alcohol um and i like a drink I actually i'm living in st albans i like i'm a fan of real ale until i discover that there's 10 spoonfuls of sugar in every pint um the point about these this is that is that particularly red wine um has got apart from the pleasure of it and the joy of it and the socialization of it and i'm you know not not to excess yeah has got the benefits of having resveratrol and polyphenols in right and resveratrol is an antioxidant and we know that anything all these long-term conditions have got in common inflammation so anything that damps down inflammation must be a good thing right Okay, and that's the benefit of the uh, resveratrol and the polyphenols in the wine support your microbiome. And we've discussed the value of the microbiome. Well, that's other... fine. That's me sort of tonight. So investor says, why are you drinking? I said, well, it's, it's always wine before the kids bedtime. <laughs> exactly. um, so um, and I found it recently the in the blue zones, they drink this Sardinian Cana now. And that's the wine that's got the highest quantities of resveratrol and polyphenols. Right. Okay. You can find it. It's a bit expensive, but if you if you make it a bit of a treat, or the other go-to I recommend is Malbec. Uh, that's my favourite red. Fantastic. Right. I had a glass of that last night, so yeah. I was doing my bit for my microbiome there. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, all I would say is I'm talking about a glass or two, not a bottle or two, Dan. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and not my night room. <laughs> because um, alcohol wrecks your sleep, and it wrecks your sleep architecture. Yeah. Yeah. And too much, I know a lot of people use uh, alcohol to help them get off to sleep and they think you get a better night's sleep. But it's not decent sleep, is it? I've seen a study into that. You don't really go into deep, deep sleep, do you? You don't. So um, um, one of my favourite devices is the Aura Ring, O-U-R-A. All right. Um, have a, I'm not necessarily saying buy an Aura Ring, but have a look at their blog because it's fantastic. Okay. And I've got quite a few clients now who got poor sleep. So we... You know, when a client comes to me and they may have various issues, I always focus on sleep, which gets ignored. Yes. And I always say, look, we can fix all these other things, but if we don't fix the sleep first, we're building our house on sand. So for those people, we recommend the Aura Ring. And the beautiful thing about the Aura Ring is you can look at what you've eaten and you can actually correlate it. So they've actually got very detailed statistical data on their website. And you can absolutely look at the evenings where you've drunk a bit and compare that with your sleep quality. I'm doing that then because sleep was my biggest problem. And I've really this year been sorting it out. Yeah. And the last week, because things were all in a bit wrong here, uh, I was getting five hours a night for a few nights in a row. And I felt just like I did a year ago. Yeah. And I was starting to get hungry, which I, I, I'm never hungry. People, anyone who knows me knows I'm never hungry because I do low carb. But even yeah. on low carb, I was suddenly getting hungry. And I was like, that's completely sleep, sleep related. I'm sure it is. Okay, so I think um, one of our in our list of podcasts, we're going to do one on sleep. So I'll stop there. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Good point. Um, okay. So, Tell us the next one about belong. Yes. So, you know, I came, at the beginning I said uh, about being religious or part of a community. Yes. So, yeah. if you're part of a supportive, nurturing community, it see, it adds about three years to your life. Right. Three we, years. Wow. Yeah. We get our old people right. We're, they're hidden from sight because they're not, you know, they're not the leading these perfect uh, social media lives. And we stick them in a residential home. Uh, they get no vitamin D, no sunlight. They get the same crap food every day, no stimulation. Um, and they give up. They lose the will to live. That's terrible. In these societies that I'm talking about, the Blue Zone societies, they're quite hierarchical societies. And in westernized societies, your social capital tends to be at its maximum on the day you retire. Right. And then the next day it disappears. Yeah, it's gone. Your yeah. social capital, your value, your validation, your structure, your reason to get out of bed. And it's particularly true for men. So we all know men who've had quite successful help, uh, professional lives and they retire and within a year they sort of melted away. I've seen that myself. There are certain teachers I know who've got to the sort of pinnacle of their career and then they're dead within a year or two of retirement. Yeah. Almost like the whole uh, reason for, for, for living has just disappeared. Yeah. So um, that sense of belonging and purpose and being a part of a tribe and a supportive tribe. Now, did you ever used to watch that uh, the whole thing on TV, The Royal Family? Oh, yeah, for sure. Right. Right. Great program. Right. Um, and he's, they're all couch potatoes. They're all sitting there. They never move and whatever. I love them. That's the perfect illustration, right? So if all your friends are drink too much, smoke too much, they're all couch potatoes. It's nudge theory that that's the life you tend to lead. Yes. If yeah. all your friends are really fit and healthy and into this, then you get sucked into it. So if you can surround yourself with a group of friends that really care and nurture you, who've got good lifestyles, you'll naturally have that. So it doesn't feel like work. It feels like, well, that's just the life I lead. Yes, I think you're right. I think it was Jim Rohn who said you become the average of the five people you spend most of your time with. And I think that is so true. It's even more true in Okinawa. Right. Because in Okinawa, you, ha you go through life with four or five friends. OK. And these four or five friends are like your life partners and they accompany you on your life course and you share everything with them. Oh, wow. How lovely. <laughs> I can't remember the name of it. The Japanese have a particular name for this little group of friends who support each other through their lives. That's gorgeous. I love that idea. It's very beautiful. So in these communities, as you age, your social capital grows and grows and grows and grows. You don't get dumped in a residential home. Yeah. And the grandparents and great grandparents has a huge role in bringing up the grandchildren and great grandchildren. Yeah. And also the other thing is they never retire. So this whole retirement thing is a bit of a Western construct. I completely agree with you on this, Graham. So, right. Can I just tell you something? I was talking to somebody recently and I said, um, I want to get my business to the point where I can do it anywhere in the world. And, and they said, well, don't you want to have a holiday from your job? I said, no, I love what I do, but I want to be able to travel with my job and do it wherever I am because I get real fulfillment from what I do. And yeah. I thought, actually, let's turn it on its head for a moment. I think it's more sad that I'd have to run away from my job and have the dread of going back to it because I didn't enjoy it. you know. But if you have a nice lifestyle you're enjoying and you love what you do every day, it's not a chore. You don't want to get away from it. You just enjoy it, but you want to do it while you're traveling with your family. So that's why, um, and, you know, and obviously we're both fans of David Unwin. He talks about having been a really disappointed GP because his health professional journey held out all this promise of what he was going to do and what he's witnessed over 30, 40 years in practice is just everyone getting fatter and sicker, less and he, happy. And he can't happy. do much about it. And he's thinking, well, what actually, I, I didn't set out to do this. And yeah. the same thing's been true for me that I reached a point where I just thought spooning more tablets into people is really unfulfilling. And the reason I'm enjoying the Prolongevity Project so much is I'm watching people, it's not really the weight loss, it's watching the light coming back into their eyes and seeing this joie de vivre re-emerging. Yeah, yeah. And that's what, as a health professional, you thought you were up for. And that's then a question, Graham. And this is very hard to answer because, of course, it's hypothetical. If you hadn't have discovered this and you, you carried on to, to a retirement of being a pharmacist who was giving out the drugs and fixing the, the problems which are not being cured, they're just yeah. being sort of sorted for today... 
and then you retired early. Mm. Do you think you could tell us what your life might be like now if you hadn't discovered this paradigm shift? I think by, by now I'd have I'd have been fat and diabetic and hypertensive, and I've had all the um, symptoms of you know middle aged, older middle age, and I'd have been a bit of a miserable sod as well. Yeah, because I, I, I can definitely see the purpose of your life. Sod, but I'm quite a healthy miserable sod. <laughs> Yeah, I know what you mean, but it's. It, I think that's true. I think it's very sad that people get to that position. Um, now, just a very aware of time, Graham, and I know we don't have very much time at all, but can you compare to maybe how we may have lived? These blue zones, are they like a bit of a, a pointer towards maybe how um, Paleolithic man used to live? Is, is there a link there? And is there any examples we can see maybe where tribal societies as well would be considered yeah. maybe to be considered a blue zone? So we were talking earlier on about Western A price. And Weston A. Price was a Canadian dentist. Yeah. And he reached the conclusion, I, it was 100 years ago, he reached the conclusion that you and I have stumbled upon 100 years later. We've rediscovered <laughs> the Weston A. Price. And he, what he did was he went around the world. He, rec he recognised that it was impossible to find healthy people in Canada where he came from or America. It yeah. just didn't exist. And he, he came up with this theory that if you live the, knife, the, the natural life that we were designed to eat in the culture you were born into that's genetically appropriate with the appropriate food. Yeah. So he went and explored all these countries around the world and came across, um, so you, he came across somewhere, so there'd be a port where it was very commercialized and yeah. everyone had adopted the Western lifestyle as it was a hundred years ago, you know, more carbs, more seed oils, all of that. And they, these people had terrible dentition and, and all the Western chronic diseases were there. Yeah. The point then was because communications were not, and infrastructure was less, you could go 10 miles down the road. So and yeah, away from the Western the road, effectively. Exactly. 10 down, miles down the road, they'd be a, a normal tribe leading their traditional life with their traditional food and they'd be fit, they'd be healthy and amazingly have perfect dentition. Wow. All those have almost disappeared now because, you know, because of the um, McDonald's and Pizza Hut and mobile phone technology and westernization Sugar and everything taken over the whole world. It's almost impossible to find. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But there are still a few tribes that still live that traditional existence. And one example is the Hasta. They're in a they're an African tribe and they pretty much still lead the same lives that they were leaving 40,000 years ago. So they have not changed suddenly their environment as rapidly as the rest of us have. Yeah. And now we're trying to patch it up with medicine. They are still living the very natural way that they've evolved to, to live. Yeah. And they're healthier because of it. So how much health are we talking? Do you, are you a fan of the food, food program, Dan? The food program? No. Radio 4. Oh, no, I'm not, but I should right. check it out. Um, I think the food program is fantastic. It explores a lot of the issues that you and I hold dear. Okay. And the food program did two episodes with the Hasda, and they interviewed Tim Spector, right? The guy with the twins. Yeah. And Tim went and spent time there, and he describes all of this. And it's I'm, I'm sure, I think the BBC podcast it's it's on a radio player or whatever it is. Oh, they, okay. Yeah, I'll have to check they, it out. You might want to uh, link to that. Yeah. So they lead they lead the lives they were designed to lead, right? They've got no health care. So they eat the traditional foods, they've got the traditional approach to healthcare, and they're slim, fit and healthy, good teeth. So you still, if you yeah. look hard enough in the world, you can still find a few tribes. What's interesting about them is they've, they've also looked at the microbiota, the you know, colony of bugs in their gut. The average Western has got about 1500 different species. Wow. The Hazard tribes have got 2000. Wow, okay. So our diminished, um, quality of food and the rubbish that we eat and the chemicals as well I thought. chemicals we've destroyed about a quarter of our microbiome incredible so they are really an echo of what we should be from the past and this is what i find very interesting as a, as a species we've had for centuries this, this idea of us being civilized and having all the answers and then they being the enlightened ones to tell the rest of the world and actually they're the ones who are more true to the lifestyle we've evolved to live that we need to, need to learn from. And more importantly, need to protect those people from what we have done to ourselves. Yeah, exactly that. So we need to return to our roots and recognize where we came from genetically. Um, but a modern interpretation of that, obviously. Yeah.
Well, Graham, thank you so much for today. That was incredible. I didn't even know what really blue zones were, particularly before today, but I've learned so much there. And I hope everyone has as well. If you have any questions for Graham, then please send them in to dan at uklowcarb.com. Um, or you can also uh, message on the Facebook group, which Graham's part of, UK Low Carb. And we are now building up and more details next week about when we'll have the final episode. So uh, for now, Graham, thank you so much for today's episode on Blue Zones. And uh, I'll speak to you again very soon. All right. All the best, Dan. Take care. Bye Cheers. Now. Bye.